improving the computer on the business of banking, Barclays Bank and Technological Change, 1959 to 1974. And in the early 1970s, I was working at the Midland Bank, so I had a special angle. <laughs> so the talk is going to be given by Dr. Ian Martin, who's a lecturer in the Department of Communications and Systems at the Open University who completed his PhD at the Centre for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine at the University of Manchester, and Professor David Parsons, who is the Royal Academy of Engineering Visiting Professor at Salford University, and used to be Advanced Technology Director at Barclays Bank, where he enjoyed a long career working with computers and their application to banking. So, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, that's the title of my PhD thesis at the University of Manchester. I was at the Open University until this Monday, and I started a new job on Monday, so I'm now working at Leeds Metropolitan <laughs> University. <laughs> um, so I've left the OU, and I'm now up in Leeds. Um, I graduated in 2010 from, from Manchester, um, and David was actually one of my interviewees for my PhD uh, project. Um, I drew on archival sources from the Barclays Group archives um, and the other bank archives in the UK, and also interviewed, um, it's almost 75 people who actually worked um, during this period, 1954 to 1974, on the systems that we've described. So we split the presentation into two. Um, I'll talk about the context and, and, and highlights from my thesis, and then David will actually go into the technical detail um, of some of the systems. Um, this period, 1954 to 74, is one that, retrospectively, Barclays dubbed phase one of their computing implementation. At the very beginning, um, you know, there, it wasn't anticipated that the whole of the branch network would be computerized. This was something that was realized as the 60s unfolded. So when, when 74 was reached, which is the end point, which was when the, the, the last branch in the network of over 3,000 branches was connected to a computer, and that was dubbed phase one, and then uh, we moved into phase two. So this is, this is phase one. 54 was when Barclays first started looking seriously at, at, at applying computers to banking. Um, there's three phases to this, um, which we've divided up for the purposes of this presentation into three types of computer that Barclays um, applied um, uh, to their business. Um, three suppliers were EMI, Amidet Computer, um, that was came first. Then IBM, a um, whole host of computers, obviously. IBM still supplied to Barclays now. Um, and Burroughs, um, which, which came uh, last in these three phases. So um, I'm going to go through those three phases. And before that, just talk a little bit about before computing and how banking worked um, in terms of technology then. Um, and then end with some conclusions. So um, this first period, um, which um, people have dubbed the 1950s as reinventing the computer as a business machine, you know, a military scientific application previously, and um, the 50s, a decade where um, we're looking at applying this to business. So I'll just go through the British banking context. Um, some of the tensions between what computing um, could provide um, and what it needed, and what banking uh, had been used to over three or 400 years of tradition. Um, and this leap from what was a mechanized accounting in a branch, a decentralized um, self-contained production unit almost in one of uh, 3,000 branches, um, to centralized accounting, which was a big, big change. Um, Barclays dealt with that by simulating a computer center with, with a punch card machine uh, as a simulation of a computer. And then I'll just touch on Barclays and EMI and how um, they decided, Barclays decided to, uh, to go with EMI out of a, uh, a number of choices. So um, the context in the 1950s, that's the, what, the, what was dubbed the big five in terms, of, in terms of the British banks. There were 11 clearing banks um, in total. These were the big five. Um, Barclays of the Midland, um, you can argue uh, which was the biggest, um, different measurements in terms of number of accounts or uh, in terms of uh, volume of deposits. Um, but Barclays is up there as, at various times as the biggest, uh, biggest bank in the, in the UK. Um, there's the little six as well, um, the, the six of the small banks. One of them we'll get to mention in the story, which is Martin's, uh, no relation to me. Um, 
And basically, there's a problem with um, staff and space, particularly in London. Um, if we go back to that slide, you'll see Barclays is very southeast and London based. You know, of all the banks, that was that was his heartland. That was that was Barclays territory. Um, so Barclays' problem, if you like, um, in London was bigger than um, than most uh, most of the other banks. The shortage is based on staff in London. Um, high turnover. You know, this is a, a decade of, um, of uh, growing affluence. Um, people are able to. Um, pick and choose between more clerical jobs. Um, so banking, uh, banking has to fight to, to retain staff. Um, and of course, when new staff come on, they have to be trained to use these, these branch accounting machines, trained to use um, the procedures in the banks. Um, there's also increasing volumes of paper, um, checks, and other um, types of paper, which was um, threatening to overwhelm the banking system at the time. Um, there's a severe problem in London, but other major cities in the UK also have had um, problems with um, staff and problems with st uh, space. You know, rents were rising as well, so it's expensive to, have, to to expand your business by creating more branches. So it's a, an expensive and difficult thing to do in the 1950s. So uh, one of the solutions um, which looked most promising was to apply computing to banking. And computing and banking appeared at, at first uh, to seem a very logical fit. Um, banking is a computational activity. It's about adding and subtracting from uh, accounts. And Ferranti, um, who um, obviously had um, a lead in the UK in terms of its, its relationship with the um, University of Manchester and its commercialisation with the Ferranti Mark I, uh, was interested in the banks as a market. Um, it's a big market. They realised the banks had a problem. Um, so it set Mary Goldring off. Um, some of you may be familiar with Mary Goldring from uh, she, the, the uh, Concorde. She, she basically uh, uh, said the Concorde would be a, an expensive mistake. Mary was a science writer for The Economist at the time. And Ferranti commissioned her to write, uh, on, encouraged was what Ferranti said, um, they encouraged her to write three articles for the banker magazine, the uh, Financial Times imprint for, for bank managers to uh, say how electronics could be applied to banks. So in a series of three articles, Mary, Mary um, hypothesized how banking could benefit from um, electronic computing. Um, there was lots of issues to overcome, um, one of which was how, how can we keep records visible on a computer? Um, there's a legal requirement for accounts to be visible. Um, printing wasn't developed at this, at this point in terms of volume printing at that point. So Mary, Mary thought of, of ways that um, data on um, electronic tape, um, uh, magnetic tape, could be, uh, could be read, electronic records could be made visible. Um, so uh, she, she set off in motion um, some ideas in the, in the banking community. And in 1955, they, the bankers set up the uh, electronic subcommittee. Um, so the, the, uh, the London Clearing Bank set up a subcommittee dedicated to looking at this electronics problem. And then they uh, had a working party of three, um, of which uh, Barclays were, had one of the members. Um, so Barclays, Martins, and Lloyds each, uh, each had a representative on this working party of three that was specifically tasked, how can we apply computers to banking? Um, it was primarily focused on the check clearing problem. That was the biggest problem at the time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it was also the most difficult of the two problems they had. One was check clearing, how can we automate check clearing? And that involved being able to, to read characters, you know, uh, which eventually were magnetic characters. But that was, a, that was a tougher problem to crack than the branch accounting problem, which was how can we automate um, the updating of accounts on a daily basis. Um, so um, they, they took, took a while um, to examine um, some of the, the proposals from the um, UK suppliers and also looked abroad to developments of the Bank of America um, where they had um, uh, developed with um, the SRI and GE the IRMA system, um, which was an automated system for clearing and, and branch accounting. Um, the thing is, though, that they'd spent uh, Bank of America had spent um, 10 million with um, SRI and 48 million with GE to develop this customized solution, and there was no way the British bankers were going to pay any, any, anything approaching that sort of money. 
and they, uh, they reasoned that they wanted a solution for free because the computer suppliers would see the, the profits come in once it was adopted by the British banks. Uh, anyway, for Anti, we're, we're not happy with that uh, approach. Um, and uh, in the letters pages of the Times, there was a Bernard Swan, the Ferranti's marketing manager, um, made it clear that he thought that the bankers would have to uh, reevaluate some of their most treasured traditions. You know, so they wanted um, Ferranti wanted uh, the banks to change their attitudes. Um, they set up a London computer centre, Ferranti, um, and that was a place where, with a Pegasus in there, they could um, invite businesses from the London area and beyond to see how they might apply computers to their business. Um, this essentially, in a nutshell, is the problem. Um, you, the UK banks could look to the US, but the US was a totally different um, banking system in terms of geography. You know, they, these were banks that were few and far between, branches that were few and far between. They were large branches, you know. Um, um, they centralised because they were large and had a lot of, of accounts per branch. Um, you know, the car culture over there meant that people would drive to a, to a branch. Um, so they centralised on tabulators between the wars, as had a lot of continental Europe. So they were already using punch card machines to do their branch accounting. This wasn't the case in the UK. In the UK, using machines like this NCR32 here within a branch to, uh, it's like a, a, a combination of an adding um, and um, typewriter, an adding machine and typewriter, in order to update um, accounts on a, on a local, local basis. So each branch would have a number of these and they would update accounts. Um, locally. Though theoretically one of the things Mary Goldring thought was that maybe there'd be a small computer that would, would fit in a branch and each branch could have its own computer. You know, it's 1952, she was looking at uh, Elliot, smaller scale computers than uh, the Pegasus, but um, she dubbed that as experimental. Um, what what the, um, the conclusion was that for computing to be economically viable, there had to be some sort of centralization. A typical large Barclays branch might have 4,000 accounts. A computer needed to process 40,000, 50,000 accounts in order for it to be uh, economically viable. So centralization of accounts was required. As I say, punch card machines have been used in the continent and US. Um, they were widespread, obviously, in the UK, but not particularly uh, used for branch accounting in banks. Except for Lloyd's Palmel branch, Lloyd's uh, Palmel had an as a historic association with the services that had about 40 or 50,000 accounts at that branch. So it made sense that they could use uh, a tabulator, a punch card machine, in order to process those accounts. Bank of Scotland had been advised by IBM when they looked at uh, computing at, at the end of the uh, 1950s that before you go to a computer, use a tabulator first. That way you'll find out how you might solve some of the political, the organisational uh, difficulties. You'll also have to buy some more equipment from us and then buy a computer after that. But a tabulator was a good way of finding out how the political and the organisational and the technical issues of communicating a branch with a central accounting unit worked. Um, Barclays had some experience of tabulators in departments such as foreign department. So, 1954, the start of the, the story, Barclays simulates a computer centre. Um, so, what it does is it shadows, um, I think there's two branches, it shadows a branch. And everything that happens in the branch, in terms of the, the vouchers that come in, so the credits, um, the checks, and the credits that come in um, into the branch and are processed locally, are also processed um, remotely by this simulated computer center. So there's somebody manning a paper tape punch, and they send the um, output from the paper tape over to the computer center where it's read in, converted to punch cards, and then processed by a punch card machine. It's then reconverted into paper tape and transmitted back to the branch so that the branch can check against the original to make sure that um, the updates have been applied correctly. Um, this went on for four or five years. Um, it was actually slower than the branches doing it themselves locally, but more accurate. Um, and over those four or five years, um, Bark has obviously learned a lot about the relationship between a branch and a central processing uh, accounting unit. Obviously, at the same time, Barclays and uh, other banks were looking at a number of suppliers from the UK and abroad, having a number of individual trials with suppliers and collective trials with suppliers as well. 
Uh, Barclays pumped for EMI. It had three three um, suppliers on its on its shortlist, three computers on its shortlist. Uh, um, Pegasus was proven, you know, as a popular popular machine. But um, Barclays choice of, of the Emdeck um, wasn't just you know a technical choice. You know, this was was the first British auto transistorized computer. Um, it was what was a technical choice. It was a political choice as well. You know, Barclays wanted to make a statement with this computer, and this was a statement that we are. Um, we, are, we are buying the most cutting edge te technology. Um, EMI, crucially, was a Barclays customer, was a customer of Barclays. So um, and there's a lot of debate about why, why um, EMI might, may have been chosen, but it seems to come down to the fact that it, it was safer, it was, it was more sensible for them to spend their money with a customer of the bank and basically keep an eye on them, and it was in their interest for EMI to be a successful um, computer supplier. Um, Midland did the same thing with English Electric. English Electric was a customer of the Midland and the Midland bought KDF machine. So uh, there was, there was a, a, a mutual relationship between the, uh, the supplier, producer and the consumer. So in 1959, Barclays orders an Emidec 1100. And it makes a point to stress, and this is a, this is a, a common theme all the way through with Barclays, we are the first British bank to order a computer. And there was a little bit of publicity to be, to, well, more than a little bit, there was publicity to be gained from these first. Uh, and this was the start of, of Barclays using computers for publicity purposes. So, Barclays orders a computer. Now we have this, this phase, uh, the EMI phase, if you like, um, where we've, Barclays really used the, the fact that um, it opens the first computer centre, um, banking computer centre, as a first to differentiate it from the other banks. Um, it makes itself a, a global first in saying that it's, it's a telecommunications first and, and the way it's configured its relationship between the uh, computer centre and the, the branches. Um, and it stresses that this is a whole data processing system. Um, and again, this, this is kind of uh, an important point, that this was um, a, a link between the centre and the branches, between the people and the procedures. Um, this was all combined into a system. Um, and this was part of convincing um, the, the customers that a computer was necessary. So there's the outside of um, Britain's first computer centre for banking, that's Barclays' uh, number one computer centre, that's what it was called. Uh, Open on the 4th of July 1961. Just um, down the road from Euston, Euston Station, that's a location card there showing the, the location of the computer centre. Um, Outside doesn't look particularly uh, impressive, I don't think. Uh, it was an old furniture, uh, furniture showroom converted. But inside, the conversion was quite spectacular. Um, that is the, uh, what you're greeted with as you open the, the front door. So that was the reception, reception area. Um, if you think about what a typical uh, bank, large bank building would have been like at the time, um, very neoclassical, lots of columns and arches, emphasising sort of uh, long-standing stability, trust, etc. And this was very much emphasising the modern. Obviously, it's quite future, futuristic. It was a large space as well. I mean, that's a hundred-foot mural that runs down the left-hand side um, there. So Barclays making a big statement with this uh, building, and with the size of the reception area, they anticipate a lot of uh, visitors. Um, this is the opening ceremony. Uh, this is uh, Postmaster General at the time, Reginald Bevins. Um, and the fact that it's the Postmaster General opening it is important because this was all about telecommunications. Um, you know, Postmaster General responsible for uh, GPO. Um, this is a statement about telecommunications. It's also a statement about modernity and the, uh, the futuristic nature of the centre. He's opening the centre there rather than cutting a tape. He's passing his hand through an infrared beam, which then lights up the centre. Um, so um, there was there was an engineer on standby at the power switch, but <laughs> this 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 worked. This op this opened up the centre. Um, so um, the the building, as I said, wasn't just a British first. Barclays were, was making this a, a global first as well in terms of the telecommunication system. It said it was the most advanced bank booking system in the world. Um, there's no real reason to doubt that at the time. I'll, I'll show you show you why. So um, there's the Emiac control uh, panel, and the visitors after the opening ceremony were led on a, a tour of the centre. 
a typical setup, glass panels to a uh, viewing area to view um, this new machinery. Um, the, the, the customer accounts were now held on, on magnetic tape, complex tapes. And this was how um, the account updates were received. Um, so paper tape was transmitted, it's like the simulation, the branch do their updates, and paper tape is transmitted from the branch to the center. This is then read, uh, read in as a series of updates and applied to the accounts on the magnetic tapes. Um, initially, 12 branches were, were connected um, with 24 lines, so uh, one in and one out, so things could be sent and received. And the, the sending back is, is the, is the, uh, is the clever bit. So in the branch, what they did was um, they modified, that is, is like one of those NCR machines we saw before, it's something that they were used to in the branch, modified one of those machines, accounting machines, it was a waste machine, it, it's called a waste machine, it's basically everything passed through that machine, so that when um, the normal part of the normal process, uh, entries were made on this machine, corresponding entries were made on an attached um, clinch paper tape output and that paper tape output was then transmitted across to the centre. So using an old technology which they were familiar with in the branches um, to, to convert to paper tape and then feed into some Creed uh, paper tape readers and transmitters. And this is uh, part of the publicity uh, leaflet that, that Bark has produced and this shows the communication. It's very important that the branch in the centre is seen as, seen as seamless because for customers they don't want to think that their accounts are actually moving away. You know, their, their relationship is the branch. This is the 1950s, 60s. You know, the branch is, is where you have your relationship with your bank. Obviously, not like that anymore. But um, in these days, you, you go to your branch. You want your accounts to be kept there. You want them to be looked after. So this seamless between the branch and centre. The bits in the red are the stuff that happens in the branch. There's the waste machine, the NCR machine. Uh, linked to a tape punch. There's the tape goes into a reader, the GPO line, and then received at the, at the um, computer centre. And this thing here, this tape checker, was a Barclays um, solution. Um, if you think about the, the branches finishing uh, their work at, at three o'clock and then getting ready and transmitting, if everything was transmitted at the end of day, all the updates were transmitted, then there was a big bottleneck. It was better to transmit things during the day. And as, as you transmitted things during the day, this machine, this tape checker, which they call the ICE, ICE machine, input checking equipment, developed by Barclays staff, um, did a parity check and, and some reconciliation check and checked that there would be no transmission errors, could catch the errors before processing and then get them retransmitted if necessary. So that, that Barclays is very proud of the ICE machine. And then the account files hold the magnetic tape were updated. Then this bit was the bit that really set um, the system apart. You know, there was no movement of paper at all between, um, between the branch and the center. So coming in, everything was transmitted over the lines. Coming out, the statements initially were also printed in the branch. So um, the, each branch would have a, have a printer um, and that had the capability of printing, um, which was an important capability, uh, which was stipulated by the branch managers of, of printing overdrawn balances in red. So it could switch between red and black. So it was very important for uh, the branch managers to have that facility, and that's what they were used to. That's what you could do before computers. We don't want to go backwards. We want, we want to red uh, for, for overdrawn. So statements printed in the branch um, initially uh, via this teleprinter, various lists as well. So the whole thing, this had not been done before, um, no movement of paper from the branch to the centre and back. It was all done over the GPO lines. Uh, this is what Barclays claimed it's, as its global first. However, as more branches were taken on, more, uh, more accounts had to be processed and, and sent over the lines. Um, there became a bottleneck. And it was then possible, once computers were established, to say to the branch managers, actually, it's not going to be possible for us to print your print statements locally anymore. We just can't, we can't manage to do that before you need them. So we're going to have to print them in-house on high-speed printers now in the branch. Um, and that is black and white. We're going to have to have DR rather than red for overdrawn. So uh, that's where that came in. But it came in sort of by stealth. 
you know, it was uh, let, let's give, the, give them, them exactly what, what they need at first, and then um, a couple of years later, high speed printing at the center. So um, that's the number one computer center up there, number one mark. These are the first three branches here to be, to be automated. That's Cavendish Square there, uh, Oxford Street. Um, it's 1,000 feet, so these are fairly close. All these things in red are Barclays branches. Um, so you can see there's quite a few in a small area um, um, there. But these were chosen as the first, uh, first three to be automated, basically sort of one a month to start off with. Um, and there was a various number of reasons, you know, who's, who's, who's the most pressed for space and staff, you know, who, who's the manager with the most sort of progressive attitude, who will welcome computers rather than see them as a, uh, as a, as a threat, uh, that's, that sort of thing. And this, this whole area was, uh, was slowly um, computerised. Barclays ordered a second ME deck as well, um, and the centre eventually did the processing for 58 branches, um, 200,000 mechanics. Almost. So this carried on the EMI centre, number one centre carried on from 1961 to 1970. Um, so it did, that did 58 branches out of what was the time was about 2,500 branches. Um, and all this time, we, the, the customers had to be convinced of why use a computer. Um, so the basic argument was, well, if we don't use a computer, we're going to have to charge you more for your accounts. Um, and that was the basic argument. And why don't we need to charge it more if we use a computer? This is from the, um, from the, the Barclays publicity literature. You know, we can store a lot of information in a small space. It's that idea of, of space again. Uh, we can store a lot more information in a very small space. We can do things very quickly as well. You know, we can store a form of arithmetic. It can make simple decisions. Um, you know, so there's a hint there, sort of uh, um, this electronic brain you know, actually making decisions. But Barclays are quick to point out to visitors to the centre that it was programmers who actually told the computer what to do. And all these programmers at the centre were bank clerks first and foremost. They were bank clerks who were retrained as programmers. Um, so, uh, you know, the computer is powerful to do things quickly, but this was all under control. Um, and just for comparison, there's the, um, the other purchases by some of the other banks um, at the same time. Martin's here with his frantic Pegasus. Martin's and Barclays are in a race to open the first computer centre. And I've, I've written about Martin's uh, in a paper that's coming out quite shortly. Um, Martin's basically you know, lost out by about a month, but had a, had a torrid time because they, they raced against, uh, against Barclays and, and came too early. We're, we're unprepared for, um, for computerised accounting. So the next phase, which overlaps, so this important point is that it overlaps, um, is, is what I'm calling the Americanization, um, which is the, the rise of IBM. Um, and uh, IBM makes its entrance through check, check clearing. Um, so we get a second computer center, a head office, Lombard Street, um, and then a third computer center, a large computer center, which is, is aimed to cover the whole of Greater London. Um, also take a swift, Detour into Barclay Card as well, which was an IBM um, solution. Um, I'm saying Americanization, I say that with um, some sort of uh, hesitancy because IBM was very keen to stress its Britishness. Um, it did this again in the Times, you know, stressed that actually we've got my manufacturing base over here, we're contributing to British exports. So, Seals as a British company, you know, obviously had a vested interest in being seen as a British company. Um, but it's very keen to say, um, you know, in terms of computers, this is now a global uh, industry and we have a base in, in the UK. So the check clearing problem um, is a sort of the, the, the rise in volumes in terms of uh, hundreds of millions of checks needed to be cleared. Uh, it's in danger of overwhelming the system, which is a manual system, um, relied a lot on female labour in order to sort checks um, according to their uh, branches and their their banks. Um, Barclays, like other, other banks, first way of attacking this was to move some of the, um, the, the sorting out of London. You know, London was where the major problem was. We couldn't get enough staff and there's common space. Go up the M1 to Northampton. So Barclays went and opened a check clearing centre in Northampton uh, to, to draw on a pool of available staff 
um, stuff there. The same thing in Bradshaw with stationary department. You know, you see this with a lot of uh, a lot of businesses moving slowly away from the centre. So the solution for um, automating check clearing came in the form of this E13B font, this stylized one, two, three, four at the top there, which came out of the Bank of America, America's Irma solution. Um, it was adopted by the American Bankers Association and the UK, the uh, London Clearing Banks looked at what happened in the US and thought we'll, we'll follow their, their solution. So we adopted the, the American E13B solution. In, the, in the Europe, they had uh, came up with a different one, CMC7. Um, but we took E13B. So American uh, banks have been using that for a year or so before British banks. American manufacturers, therefore, had, had a head start in terms of working with the E13B. So they, they, uh, they had an advantage, uh, American manufacturers, over the British manufacturers. So IBM came to Barclays through check clearing. Um, we trialled a, uh, a, a check clearing uh, reader sorter um, early in the 60s. And then in 1963, hooked that reader sorter up to an IBM 1401 to do uh, check clearing. Um, 1964, um, they decided to uh, order an IBM 1460 for head office, this Lombard Street, their second computer centre for Branchy County. Um, but this momentous announcement on the 7th of April 1964 changed, changed Barclays' plans. They decided to wait for System 360 and uh, installed that at head office. So the second computer centre for Branchy County was an IBM System 360. Um, Card, which was 67, was an all IBM solution. I'll explain why on the next slide. And in 1967, Barclays opens its Greater London Computer Centre, which is an all IBM <coughs> computer centre. And there's some photos from the IBM Computer Centre there. So why was Barclay Card IBM? Because Barclay Card was just Bank America Card, a licence of Bank America Card. Barclays and uh, Bank of America had a very close relationship, some mutual admiration thing going on there. Uh, Barclays liked the way Bank of America, uh, Bank of America uh, was forward thinking with its technology. Bank of America liked Barclays because it's global. Um, so um, yes, they, they basically took Bank of America, the first licensee outside the US, and brought it to the UK. Um, adapted the software, um, localized it, basically converted uh, dollars to, uh, to sterling. Um, this was written in assembly language, had to be run on the same machines that Bank of America were running it on. Bank of America had running, been running it for a long time on an IBM 7070, which was a, uh, quite an esoteric machine, difficult to get hold of. Um, but Barclays had no choice really. Once committed to this run business front, they had to try and source IBM 7070. So they went over to America and borrowed time on the machine in California for Bank of America's. Um, they went to Sweden and borrowed time on a 7070 in Sweden, and they borrowed time for a, lo uh, a long time in Germany at Thyssen uh, Krupps, and um, basically carried on doing that until uh, Bank of America could convert the program to COBOL, and then they were free from this tie with 7070, and they could run it on a System 360 machine. So that had to be IBM. You know, the, the, this, this thing was a business decision. IBM came, came with that. So there's the three computer centres um, in 1967. Number one is the number one, the EMI computer centre. Um, number two is head office there, right in the city of London. Um, that was an IBM solution. Almost like a personal computer for head office, that one. You know, there was a, uh, it was basically running, running a particular head office um, functions. And then uh, the big computer centre, very close to um, number one, the Greater London Computer Centre at Tottenham Court Road. So quite close together. Um, by 1967, by that point, IBM was the main supplier to four of the big five banks. The only big five bank that wasn't buying from IBM predominantly was the Midland, which continued with its, uh, its relationship with the English Electric, Leo Marconi. So this is the next phase now. IBM. Uh, until 1967, quite, quite happily um, taking on more and more branches. Um, IBM um, initially was a step 
back in terms of in terms of communication between branch and centre. Initially, the um, the paper tapes had to be hand carried from the branches to to the IBM centre until they got teleprocessing working, and then. And the, the IBMs were actually teleprocessing rather than uh, having to wait for paper tape input. So, um, a little step backwards, um, and then IBMs doing teleprocessing. But at this point, uh, Burroughs comes along, and Burroughs wants to compete with IBM, um, sees the bank as an, an important market. Burroughs, um, the founder of, of Burroughs, was a banker himself. He understood the banking market. They'd made a raft of adding machines and electromechanical machines for the branches, but they've been a bit slower with the move to, to computers. They've not gone through the tabulator phase, which, which helped uh, the others. So Burroughs was, was, uh, was interested in, in contesting the, uh, the, the monopoly IBM was, uh, was, was having with the banks. Um, the banks had a reason to speed up their automation. Uh, decimalization was coming along. Um, they also had, had a feeling that actually we could do some real-time computing now. Before, we used to update in real-time, if you like, on these, on these branch counter machines. That was a real-time update. You update the piece of paper and you filed it. Now we update overnight, you know, and we, we, get, we get the results back the next day. So can't we go back and, and go, go to real-time again? And there's also, during this period, a merger between Barkin and Martins, which is very important. Uh, so this move to real-time was uh, precipitated by the decimalization announcement. So uh, James Callan's 1966 budget announcement, decimalization for the 15th of Feb, 1971. So decimalization meant that all these machines in the branches, these, these electromechanical machines, uh, by this time, by the way, just a reminder, only 100 branches, although you know, this, the automation programs have been moving on, there's only 100 Barclays branches actually connected to the computer. The rest of them, 2,400, are still using the electromechanical machines in the branch. And those electromechanical machines need to be converting or replacing to work with decimal currency. So there was a, a sort of a, a growing, growing feeling that, well, rather than converting all these machines, which actually we're going to get rid of now, we know we're going to go to a computer now, why don't we convert to everybody to computerise accounting before Feb 15th, 1971? And then we'll, we'll, we'll solve this decimalization problem. And Sabre had proved that real time, Sabre's American Airlines reservation system had proved that real time had commercial applications. Um, so there, there was, there was a, a reference system there. And Burroughs came along and, and sold itself against IBM as this, as this um, company that was um, forward thinking in the future in terms of technology. Um, it understood banking needs. You know, it came from banking background. Um, most importantly, probably, it undercut IBM on price. Um, when Barclays made its order for a real-time system, um, it was half the price, 11 and a half million for Burroughs, it was half the price of the equivalent um, IBM system. So IBM came at 23 million, Burroughs came at 11 and a half million. Um, and, uh, you know, it was technically excellent. Um, everybody would say that you know, the integration of hardware and software was a, was a, a technically elegant solution. Um, so Barclays went over to the U US and was sold uh, the idea of this B8500 machine, this, this enormous machine which would be able to handle the accounting for the whole of, um, of the branch network. So it would be able to, to do everything for, for the whole of the country, one system. Um, Two orders had already gone uh, to US Steel and the University of Wisconsin. Um, so Barclays was, wasn't in uncharted territory with this B8500. And also uh, Barclays was followed by the Midland and um, also the National Provincial made an order for B8500. Uh, Barclays thought with this B8500 it would have the biggest online uh, real-time banking system in the world. So I've got a short video to, to show you here because um, what happens at the same time is Barclays feeds Tomorrow's World, in Tomorrow's World program in 1969, Tomorrow's World goes a step further with Barclays' encouragement and says, well, this is a real-time system, not just for branch accounting, but also we can make this like point of sale terminals in the shops and we can communicate in real time between transactions made in the shops 
and the bank computer. So just watch this short video, this uh, a couple of minutes from Tomorrow's World from 1969. This machine will give one single British bank a computer capacity greater than all but a handful of the world's most developed nations. Every detail of all the accounts held by the bank will be stored in its memory, ready for instant access and updating. It's the electronic equivalent of many thousands of ledger clerks. But the trading system that this vast computer makes possible is revolutionary because it's so ordinary. The heart of it is a simple desktop computer terminal, hardly more complex than a telephone and cheaper than most cash registers. It's linked to the central computer by the existing telephone network. Computer online. The shop is identified by pressing a button. Please insert your card. The customer's magnetically coded card links his bank account with that of the shop. Identification code, please. This secret code gives the computer permission to extract money from the customer's account. Confirmed. The assistant enters the amount of the sale and providing the customer has the funds to cover it, the transaction is complete. Nineteen pounds received. Thank you. The money has been subtracted from the customer's account and added to the shops without a single penny changing hands. The system could eventually make cash entirely redundant, thus eliminating the elaborate security arrangements that are needed to protect it, and at least some of the amount of paperwork that's needed to keep track of it. Checks and credit cards generate even more paperwork and have the additional disadvantage of involving an element of risk around £6 million pounds worth are bounced each year. The computer system is bounce-proof. It simply won't work unless you have cash or credit at the bank, and this, combined with the saving of time and effort, should make it completely acceptable to any retailer. It seems likely that the system will prove equally attractive to the customers. No longer need they be stuck without cash or with a pocket full of unacceptable checks or credit cards. A situation that's frustrating for the customer and sometimes damaging for the shop. So you might have noticed in the video that um, the, the picture of the, the Burroughs B8500 system was a, a little model like it is here. You know, this, this, this system never got built. Um, and you, know, you might forgive tomorrow's world for getting a little bit carried away. Um, so it, it, it's trademark early. But um, Barclays um, got um, sold a system that, that wasn't delivered um, as well, this B8500. Um, so, this was uh, promised to Barclays in usual lead times of sort of 18 months, something like that, um, ordered in, in 67, promised for the first half of 1969. Um, they weren't um, going for the point sale terminals in the shops, you know, this was uh, for the branches to automate branch accounting, and this, the other half of the order was the TC500, this intelligent branch terminal. Um, and Burroughs was selling this very much as you know, um, a system which is a balance between processing locally in the branch here, this is a multiprocessor machine, you know, quoted as having the same processing power as an IBM 1401, and then the central processing in the, in the computer centre. Um, so, uh, what the communications of the ACM said at the time, um, they were repeating that Barclays boast that this system, which is obviously they've been assured by Burroughs, will be able to provide an up-to-date response to any branch transaction within 2.5 seconds and handle 1 million transactions per hour. So this 2.5 seconds was, a, was under 3 seconds, which was kind of what people were calling real time. So this was a promise from, from um, Burroughs to Barclays. And Barclays was a bit concerned at this point that it was falling behind. Um, you know, at the time of, of the Eminet Computer Centre, um, the number one computer centre, it was the technological pioneer. Um, but it had fallen behind in, the, in this interim period. And this was a chance now with this, this setup to, to, to regain its uh, position. So ordered a 
TC500 for every single branch and, and uh, the BA500. Now, um, in 1967, before the machine came, uh, Barclays started to assemble two programming teams, uh, an applications team and a uh, technical team, a systems programming team. Um, te technical team, this, this was a this was, um, you know, joint effort between Burroughs and, and Barclays, was responsible for getting the TC500s to talk to the, the B8500. They didn't have a B8500, but there was a b 5500, which was uh, smaller, oh, not completely compatible with a smaller uh, version. Um, one thing that became apparent was that actually this, this vision of the TC500s and the balance between the B8500 and the TC500 was a vision. Actually, they hadn't managed to get the TC500 to talk to a, a central computer yet. So this was a job for the Barclays technical team, um, which David was uh, a lead member. Um, and then we'll talk about the details of, of getting that to work shortly. Um, so Barclays set off with Burroughs to try and get these, these machines working. Uh, meanwhile, in 1968, one of the applications team members from Barclays goes to a CUBE meeting, that was the Cooperating Users of Burroughs Equipment, a user group. Uh, goes to a user group and is told by one of the Burroughs engineers, you're not going to get the B8500 on time. Um, you're going to get two 6500s instead. Um, uh, and in the meantime, we'll, we'll give you one of these smaller B5500s. So Barclays top management go ballistic. You know, they're told via, you know, an engineer tells a Barclays programmer that this order is not gonna, gonna be fulfilled on time. Um, it gets worse because then the, the lead Burroughs engineer leaves the, the project. So the person with the most experience of getting the TC500s and, and, and the main computers to talk together leaves. So David steps up to take over from his position um, and gets the TC500s and the B5500s talking successfully together. Um, the, at that point, um, you know, this real-time idea of, of everything being completed within three seconds has to be modified. They, they, they suddenly realise it's not going to be possible to do everything within three seconds. So transactions are classified into one of three priorities. Um, which is classified as giving an on-time response rather than a real-time response. So urgent amendments, things that have to be done straight away, um, are, done, are given a priority one, and they are given real-time real-time status. Um, so things such as stopping a check, you know, which had to be done straight away, will be given a real-time status. Um, things that had to be done, uh, you know, that day, but not absolutely immediately, like updating customer accounts, were basically uh, given a priority two, and they'd be done when. They, the next free slot on the computer came available. So they were done as, as soon as possible. And then the third priority were, were things like change of address, which didn't have to be done immediately. You know, we had some notice about that. You could schedule that akin to a normal batch processing. So real time becomes, becomes long time. Uh, well, fortunately, um, things get worse. Uh, Wilson Computer Centre, which is Barclays' fourth computer centre for branch accounting, its first sort of suburban computer centre, it's up on the outskirts of, uh, of London. It's sandwiched between a rail, very busy railway line, a very busy road. Um, and there's lots of problems with vibrations at the centre. Um, the equipment, Burroughs equipment, is deemed by Barclays have to be extremely sensitive. So there's frequent disc crashes. There's frequent problems with the air conditioning. There's frequent problems with dust. Uh, there's a lot of problems with the site of this computer centre, which used to be an old uh, motorcycle uh, warehouse uh, factory. Um, it's not ideal, but Barclays had to get some work quickly so they, they chose this centre and they could have a lot of problems with the, the hardware in the centre. Then Burroughs goes and cancels the B8500 project. Um, it's got a massive backlog of, of B6500 orders, which it's promised Barclays in, instead. Um, uh, Barclays in the Midlands stay committed to Burroughs. They, they, they think things are going to work out. The National Provincial pulls out. Um, the National Provincial has a good excuse for pulling out. Um, and this is a, an important excuse that comes into play later. National Provincial is merging with Westminster to become, uh, to become that West. Um, so it's got a merger going on, so it doesn't really need, want to, to, to take on a project of this size. And also, uh, the Westminster is heavily uh, an IBM uh, bank. So Barclays and Midlands stay and persevere. Uh, and in 1969, August 69, remember the deadline is 1971, February 1971. Uh, the first branches are connected. 
but there are long processing delays, there are lot, lots of problems. Um, and there's a rivalry between the Great London Centre, which is IBM, which is still going on doing its work, taking on more branches. Um, there's a rivalry between the IBM Centre and the Burroughs Centre, you know, and there's this, these jokes about how far behind processing um, they are with, at the Burroughs Centre. Um, and IBM, obviously, at, 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 at the Great London Centre, you know, I, I'm not one, don't discourage this sort of rivalry. You know, I'm quite keen to, to, to see Burroughs failing uh, with its implementation. Um, so there, there's a, a, a very competitive rivalry. Um, the estimate for the installation of the B6500 at this point was still on a B5500, a small machine. The estimate for the B6500 is 19, uh, October 1970. And originally, you know, the whole branch network was going to be online for, for D-Day, February 1971. So they recast the um, D-Day as an interim milestone. That was the point where we'll have all the branches with TC500s now. You know, we won't, we won't have the supercomputer, we won't have everything in real time, but we will have TC500s in the branches. The TC500s are being supplied, there are a few issues, but nothing compared to what the problems on the, on the main machines. It's all looking a bit messy. It's all uh, bad publicity for the bank. Um, they've got a way out, though. Um, 1969, 1968, 1969, merging with Martins offers a, offers a way out. Martins has got about 800 branches. It's the uh, it's heartlands, um, sort of the north, the northwest there. Um, it has bought Pegasus. It's, it's dabbled with IBM, but eventually done with NCR. It's got different machines to Barclays. Um, it's also got 800 branches which need automating. So this merger, this work that needs to be done for the merger, this fact that there's different types of hardware at Martins, gives Barclays a reason to say, well, actually, we would have done this Burroughs project. This Burroughs project would have worked, but we had this Martins merger to contend with. So that was actually publicly um, the, the statement from, from uh, the head of the Burroughs project on Barclays' side, Alan Duncan. That was the statement. Uh, that the major setback with the Burroughs project could be traced to the Martins merger. Prior to that merger, things were on track. So the Martins merger is useful, uh, very useful for Barclays, because things don't go any better. Uh, on February the first, uh, February fifteenth, the day, there's there's just thirty branches connected to to Wills in the Burroughs Computer Centre, and efforts have been refocused on the IBM installation um, at Greater London. They realise that um, uh, basically the Burroughs, Burroughs system is not working as it, as it should do for, for a, a number of reasons. Um, Barclays basically announces that Burroughs computers to be replaced with IBM, not because Burroughs was a failure, but because we need to rationalise our computers now we've merged with Martins and we're replacing with one supplier which happens to be IBM. That was the, the rationale. And also, the Burroughs project wasn't seen as a failure because the TC500s, half of the solution, were kept in the branches. And the TC500s were modified to talk to the IBM uh, mainframes rather than to talk to the, the Burroughs machines. So um, there was a way of, of, of saving face. Um, and slowly, uh, although the Burroughs machines stayed there at Wilsdon, um, the, the backing wasn't for the, with the project and the computers were eventually moved, removed in 74. So uh, this is really the completion um, of the automation phase. Remember, we started in 1954. Um, this, this phase after Burroughs is, is the IBM, if you like, catching up and automating the rest of the, of the network. Yeah, and this has all been a London story so far. You know, the Greater London Centre, Willesden, all this has been London. But this period sees the opening uh, and the expansion outside of, of London. So there's a general decentralization that's gone on in the 50s, 60s with you know, roads that allowed, allowed businesses to communicate with the capital um, more freely. It's governments had to lead by example, you know, moving things like the DVLC and passports, etc., out, out from the center. Um, and businesses have slowly, as I said, moved from the London up the M1 to places like uh, Northampton and, and uh, Bletchley, etc. And they now move further afield and Bark is open to a computer center here. It's first one outside the capital. It's, it's later than every other bank in doing this. Um, it's going to be an excuse, if you like, because it's a southeast based bank, uh, generally. But it opens this building here, it's first purpose-built um, computer centre in Withenshaw in, uh, in Manchester, sort of uh, south of Manchester. 
on the border of Cheshire. Um, and this is in, in the midst of a, uh, a large social housing project. Um, this is, is there. Um, there's other computer centres around. There's a, there's a big source of labour in this area um, for the bank. And on the, uh, on the, on the uh, 1974, and they've moved, and then in 1974, they automate the last branch. Um, so they finally automate the whole of the branch network. And that is the point when it's deemed phase, phase one. Uh, this goes with IBM 370s by this point. Um, initially, this was going to have Burroughs machines, and th th this was going to be uh, the northern side of things. But um, they go with uh, IBM 370. So, uh, just a few conclusions here. Um, one thing is the, the sort of an even um, non-linear progression of technology. So, uh, you know, there's very much a, a few little branches in, in London, first of all, and then it spreads from, from London. Um, not, not even out from the centre of the computer centre. You know, there's different reasons for, for branches getting, getting computer automation um, based on their attitude, their size, uh, requirements, etc. It's not linear, you know, this wasn't just a case of start, start with some basic technology and, and then go up to more advanced. I mean, you know, the Burroughs system was very advanced but didn't work out. And then went back to an IBM solution, which was not technically as, as advanced. Paper tapes initially were sent over GPO lines, but were then later hand-delivered. So there's this sense of technology not just marching on, but, but going forwards and, and backwards. Um, and the, the old and the new were there all along. You know, the old branch accounting machines were, were integrated into the systems. Um, paper tape was there alongside the computers. So it's a point maybe the degradation and the shock of the old. You know, the old technologies tend to get overlooked, but in this case, they are they're integrated into the system. Paper, you know, one of the oldest technologies around, was very much the heart of, of these systems. And it was cautious innovation. You know, this is 20 years to automate the branch network, 54 the simulation, 74 the last branch. It had to be because it's a business we're dealing with here. The business had to be preserved. Um, and lastly, um, one thing I thought of, and I was delivering over to, obviously to you as an audience, is in order to conserve, you know, a data processing system, something that doesn't isn't just the computer, you know, the IBM computer, or the EMI computer, or the Burroughs computer, but is the branch terminals and is the communication in between them. You know, how you could possibly do that and then show people how things worked on a day-to-day -day basis is a, is a hell of a hell of a challenge. So that's me. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to David. happening in, um, in Barclays, I'm going to uh, give you a little taste of uh, some of the technology that sat um, behind it, if I can operate um, Ian's uh, system. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about each of the um, um, pieces of hardware, but I can get this to sit somewhere. I'll put it in my pocket, hopefully it'll work. Does it work? Yeah. Are you still here? Good. Um, I'll talk a little bit about each of the systems as we go through in the, 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 the three waves. I'm going to need to explain very quickly to you a little bit about what the branch accounting application logically looked like and the clearing, because you need that to put all this technology into a context. I'll make a few comments about the hardware and the, the, the software. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time telling you how the systems were technically um, used and I'll feed in <coughs> a few anecdotes and conclusions, but I'm going to have to go fast and you're going to have to listen um, quickly. If I go too fast, put your, put your hand up. Okay, this is branch accounting application on one PowerPoint slide. 
basically, it is important to remember that there was, a, there was and still is a money transmission system in this country, which means that you can pay in at any, almost any branch a credit for almost any other bank and branch with checks drawn on any other set of banks and branches. So in the branch, you've got, you've got two situations. You've got all sorts of transactions which come into a branch, which are analysed and sorted through this system that Ian explained called a, um, a, um, the waste, and they basically comprise transactions and amendments and stuff for this branch, but also transactions for other banks and branches. And it's that lot that have to be sorted out, not just into um, other Barclays branches, but other banks. And Ian said that there were 11 clearing banks, but there are a whole load of other things as well, because you're paying money orders, postal orders, all sorts of um, rubbish. And that lot had to be sorted and sent out to this process we call clearing. What we did for this branch was, oh, well, that's fine, we just collected them. We have to sort and merge those so we can process them. But we have to sort and merge them with all the stuff that other branches and other banks have been doing in that process I explained, and that comes into us. So we end up with everything for this branch, and basically the process was we have to update the ledgers up print the custom statements and file away the transactions, file away the ledgers and come up with any reports or refers of people going overdrawn or anything like that. That's the quick background. You've now had the one and a half minute tutorial on branch accounting. <laughs> okay, what about the MEDEC systems? Well, I've lectured on this in this room a couple of times before and in detail up, up in Manchester, so I'm not going to go through this in any um, real detail. The machine itself, magnetic core, magnetic drums, big operators console which you'll see and see and see again, peripherals from all over the place, Ampex tapes for anti and Elliot tape readers, uh, Creed punches, Elliot pun uh, punch, um, card punches, uh, and, and from ICT and printers, Analex and, uh, and Samus uh, Stronic. This is what they tended to look like. You've seen these pictures before, typical bays of of um, electronics, the Wurlitzer type um, control with, um, with the um, tapes. Typically, this would be the, um, the processing bays. This is a machine with three drums. These would be I.O. punch, paper tape reader, pu uh, paper tape punches, tape readers, and all that sort of um, stuff. That tends to be how they were laid out. Um, typical paper tape, uh, so um, mag, mag tape, so Ian's already explained, quite interesting mag tapes as I'll um, describe to you in a moment. And there's a, a typical printer, that's another Analex printer in a slightly fancier um, um, shrouding. And this of course is, the, um, is Don's famous uh, a picture of the console um, at, um, at um, uh, the Barclays, that's in the number one uh, computer room. There is a, a one or two important bits that you can't see down here. Um, there was a switch there that to use for some offline working, which I'll explain. And if I still had my slides, which I'm afraid were lost by the Barclays Training Department, I actually have uh, had taken colour slides in um, real detail of all those screens, and I could tell you um, which program was running. I can tell you it was program number 204, which was printing and um, uh, producing custom statements. So that's what it looked like. The configuration at number one, we had two machines. One was in 1100, the other was in 1101. In architectural terms, no difference. Uh, they both had 1,024 words, 36-bit uh, um, words, four and a half K bytes by today's uh, standards. Uh, Drum had 4,096 blocks of uh, four words each, um, so 16,384 words, one inch wide, uh, mag tapes, four on each. Franti FR300 paper tape readers, Creed 3000 punches. We had two on each machine, which was switched. Um, we were producing tapes so quickly that we had to be able to, to switch to keep going whilst the operators were putting um, another mile or two of tape on. Um, uh, 6S tape punches, the Amlex printers. And of course, on one of the machines, the pioneering work that we did, we had some IBM tape drives. And there was offline uh, tape, um, uh, tape to printer uh, capability. So how do we use all this stuff? Well, Ian's already explained the, um, the way it all worked. 
but we collected um, information from the waste processing on NCR 3208 machines. The 08 uh, stands for eight registers. There were eight registers on that, and the way that it worked was that the house items, the items for our branch, were extracted, punched onto paper tape, sent by our full duplex broadband system running at 50 baud, um, using the uh, 6S uh, transmitters. And at the centre, you've already seen this, we collected um, the input during the day on the um, on bay in bays of reperforators. The tapes themselves went through this ice machine, which was designed by Mr. David Thomas, and uh, one of the uh, slides referred to. David, he's still alive and well, he's well into his 90s, he's still a radio and down in Cornwall, still talk to him occasionally over the, over the um, air. Uh, but that was doing some pre-checking, as Ian explained. It was checking the format, it was checking the parity, it was checking that the format of each transaction was at, um, absolutely correct, that the account number was only so many digits long, that the amount was only so many characters long. And then we, during the day, we collected the transactions on um, uh, grandfather, father, son system of, of, of tapes uh, in order that we could update them um, overnight. It was still batch processing. So we applied them to the accounts, the accounts were held on, on, on magnetic tape. Reports produced back for the, to go back to the branches using these very high speed Cree machines, they were absolutely amazing to watch. They were punching 30 inches of tape a second. They were automatically checking that the punching was correct. You were five holes behind, so if you got an error and you were going to correct it as an operator, you better be able to count up to five accurately, otherwise there was going to be a real, real problem. Particularly if the hole that you were correcting was putting red on or black on to sort out the red or the uh, the red overdraft or the black credit balance. And they were transmitted back. We had a, a banks of these machines, which again were transmitting, transmitting the, the reports back to the branches. And subsequently, as Ian said, um, many of the reports were um, uh, produced using the Analex um, line printer. And when that um, started to happen, of course, we were no longer completely separate. From, uh, from the branches at the centre. So, what happened was that there were some important changes had to go on in order to feed these big computer gods. And the relationship, the computers affected the relationship between, between the customer and the branch. Um, we knew customers by name. Computers like to work with numbers. So we had to give accounts numbers, didn't we? And so the checks and other vouchers required what we called personalization. And personalization meant, and you've got them on your checkbook just like I have, we put names on them and we put um, numbers on them. We put them on using these funny characters, the MICR um, characters. But it was no longer possible when we were updating the accounts on the computer um, for a customer to walk in off the street and say, I want a statement. They say, fine, we'll order you a statement. It will be here tomorrow. Big backward step as far as some customers uh, were concerned. Um, the planned automated clearing required that, as I've just mentioned, we had additional MICR characters to enable machine reading. Incidentally, we still use MICR um, uh, characters in the, in the clearing. They're not read magnetically, it just transpired that the shape of the E13B MICR characters presented an absolutely brilliant set of characters to read optically, and most of it is done optically now. And as Ian's already mentioned, IBM was selected to provide the clearing uh, technology to sort the transactions and to provide more direct input for the um, uh, computers instead of um, the branches entering all this stuff using their NCR machines. So just a few comments about the machine itself, and I have spoken in detail about this at various places. It was interesting. A lot of people forget that there was a little plug on the back of a processor, 
And if you moved it from one socket to another, it stopped computing in binary pennies and computed in binary halfpennies. That's because we still had pounds, shillings and pence and halfpennies and farthings. They didn't go as far as farthings. And some retailers, like Boots, actually rather like their 19 and 11 pence halfpenny prices. The other thing that I found really interesting um, looking, looking back was the offline capability. We never actually printed anything directly. We only ever pr uh, printed effectively in quotes to a tape and then we ran the tapes offline to the printer. The reason's obvious. We were using paper in printers. And paper has a habit of two things, tearing and running out. And the last thing you want is to stop the computer working because the paper's torn. So um, the offline printing was, was absolutely quite brilliant. And uh, we could actually run um, by flicking a few um, switches. I think it was called the test mag tape switch on the tape controller. You could actually switch it to uh, automatically connect to a defined um, uh, um, printer, and you could run your, your printing jobs uh, without interfering with the processing on the um, uh, computer. And of course, if you've got two computer rooms, you can actually move tapes wherever you've got printing um, capability. The other thing that was quite good, these big, chunky, one-inch wide tapes, 16 tracks, actually recorded the data twice. It, had, um, it was only using six-bit coding, plus parity, plus clock tracks, and all that sort of, sort of stuff. And it did two, uh, two features of it. It recorded the data twice, and the best signal got transmitted into the, into the core. Uh, we had our own checks on it as well, sequence checks, parity checks, and every, everything else. But it also was a fixed block structure. And tapes, as you know, need an interrecord gap. Well, they had an interrecord gap, but the interrecord gap was always the same size. And you wrote up the tape alternate blocks. When you go back to the end, you turned round and wrote in the interrecord gaps, which you'd miss on the way back. So that you never wasted time rewinding tapes. When you'd finished the tape run, the tape was back at the beginning. Save time. And uh, it worked. The other thing that I loved when I was a duty programmer was that on that console, there was a loudspeaker. And the instructions were actually audio monitored as they were executed. And you could play the instructions, you turn the volume up um, through the loudspeaker. My, um, uh, my duty programmer's room was down at the front of that building that um, Ian showed you. I actually visited it this morning. It's now part of the health service. And I went in because it was open. It's never been open before when I've been past it. And I went and told the, the, the guy on the desk that I worked here 50 odd years ago in that office. And he let me have a, just a little look around their, uh, their, their foyer, which is really quite magnificent for a national health building. They've left um, some of it, but not the mural, and that's, um, uh, that's uh, gone. But in any case, what I, what, in my office down at the front, there were a couple of um, uh, old phones that you could put on a speaker. And so on the internal, when I was uh, their duty programmer during the night, uh, I got the computer operators to use their internal phone to dial one of the two phones in my office, one from each um, from computer room, so that I could sit there listening. And after a while, the programmers got used to the sound of what was normal and what wasn't. And there were a few times when we went down to the computer and we said, wait, you've got a problem. I don't know if you know it, but you've got a problem. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's obvious, I can hear it. And that was really quite a useful feature. I don't know whether EMI intended that, but it was a, a, a great feature in any case. So, what were some of the key innovations? Ian's already covered a lot, a lot of this. It really was the first fully online computer accounting system with about 60 West End branches and uh, mostly Pall Mall and <coughs> other few local ones. Initially, everything was online, everything um, was, was, was remote, no paper at all. But subsequently, as we've mentioned, we got um, uh, uh, the printers going, particularly for things like balance lists and statutory returns and customer statements. And Ian mentioned the problem of the um, uh, uh, printing credit uh, balances in black and uh, debit balances in red. 
And um, uh, I remember a local director coming in and, and really complaining about this, about this backward step. And um, I said to him, Sir, if you want debit balances in red, you can have them. And he said, thank you. I said, you've got to have credit balances in red as well. Because I can put a red ribbon on and everything will be in red. He said, well, why didn't someone just explain that problem uh, uh, to us in the first place? Which is interesting. It teaches you something about keeping the, uh, the customer in, informed. We did do some interesting things because once we got the, the clearing coming in, we could do things like making it more accurate to detect checks that are being stopped by the customer. Because we knew the account number, we knew the branch number, we knew the number of the check. Um, we even knew the amount. So if we just programmed uh, the, uh, the system to trial, looking for stopped checks for the branches, and, and that worked as, as well. Um, on the Emidex, we did the first split of two branches into one. 360 strand uh, was split into two branches, one became 415 strand. I wrote program P415, which actually did the split. And um, our own end colleagues were going to do this all manually, they estimated it would take about 30 days. Um, Malcolm Williamson, who is now Sir Malcolm Williamson, ex-chief executive of Standard Chartered Bank and so on, he was a, a programming skivvy with me at the time, um, he and I developed um, a system. Uh, we did it in just over 20 minutes. Um, but what we also did, and uh, I'll, I'll cl lay claim to this, was that I had the idea that if I knew which accounts were going to move, I would be able to extract the details of those accounts because we were given uh, the account, um, the, the number of the account which was going to move, and we're going to we're given their new account number, and uh, I automatically produced all the program constants that were going to be necessary for an idea which we had, which we could run against the clearings as they came in for all the checks that were still in circulation, which hadn't been, um, uh, which were still had the old numbers on. And so we generated some automatic code to actually sort out and redirect checks. Interesting stuff. And then, of course, there was um, the input of initially check clearing, subsequently standing orders, uh, staff salary transactions using the IBM um, uh, DEX link to the EMI um, uh, uh, systems. It was a showpiece, as Ian's explained. It really was. I mean, the bank went mad on it. It was enclosed in glass. We had the ability to dim the lights. We could take all the covers off of all the all the panels, and sitting at the end of the panels were huge numbers of, of display lights in glorious colour. And if we dimmed the lights and were processing, there it was a, a, a solid lumiere shell, I tell you, because we turned the loudspeaker up, put it over the uh, tannoy system, and uh, the visitors had a real good show. It was on television many times. Um, we. Um, uh, uh, um, Someone in EMI wrote a, a, a program to um, uh, enable you to play music through the loudspeaker. We got hold of, I got hold of that program, found out how they'd um, done it and made a, 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 a few modifications and we put some Christmas carols in, some barks of Mozart, that sort of thing. And it was um, often played at Christmas, but unfortunately, Ian's efforts and my efforts to track down copies um, have failed. We both tried with the BBC archives. It was Jack DeMonio, wasn't he? In the early today program, uh, particularly at Christmas, but they haven't got them. And as he, Ian said, it ran for nearly 10 years. Um, it wasn't decimalised, and the branch were, the branches were transferred mostly to um, Greater London, the old Greater London initially, um, ahead of, of decimalisation. And it was um, Gradually, bye bye, um, bye bye, Emidec. We moved into IBM, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the clearing, a little bit about some of the IBM systems that we we had, and um, some of the differences <coughs> that um, occurred. And again, a few anecdotes and um, and conclusions. How are we doing? Not. We're going to have to move. The clearing system. Well, what happens? in clearing is that clearing gets 
information from two sources, from the branches of Barclays, and um, it um, in 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 a simple uh, system, it has to take the vouchers it gets from its own branches with the vouchers for Barclays branches that it's got from other banks. Okay, like with me, has to get those together and it has to sort them out into, for internal reasons, all the branches, the vouchers for each Barclays branch and then all the vouchers that have come from the other banks for Barclays branches and then get them all merged into individual branches, put them onto tape or disc and um, both physically send the checks to the branches and the tapes and discs to the appropriate computer centre. And um, as well of course as doing that, it is sorting out the vouchers received from Barclays for other banks, it sorts those into the individual banks and sends the, those checks, etc., to the other bank clearing um, systems. The reason that it was very important to actually keep what had come from the other banks separate is so that the bank's accounts at the Bank of England can be properly updated. Because at the Bank of England, Barclays had an account, Lloyd's had an account, and so on. And the totals of the clearing were either added or subtracted to the balance so that money collected by, um, by Lloyd's for Barclays could come to, and so on and so forth. Are you with me? It's quite a, a, it appears simple, but it's actually quite a complex uh, thing. So what happened? Well, Ian's explained this. Originally, we ran clearing with 1401s, 1419 uh, breeder sorters, um, but for branch accounting and other related applications, we were using the IBM uh, 360, 370, various models, 360, 30 at Longwood Street, the 50 at um, Greater London, and subsequently, over the years, they moved into 65s, 165s, 168s, 30, 33s, 38, 81s. I presume they're using Z these days, I don't know. It's been a long time since I did anything with um, uh, the IBM uh, machines at Barclays. The clearing operational by June 1963 uh, on 1401s, which were driving the reader sorters, the tapes and removable discs, these reader sorters had to be fed um, and kept loading manually, so you didn't dare drop anything, because the sort algorithms are actually um, very simple. Uh, they might not appear logical, but um, uh, they actually, you actually sort from least significant to most significant um, um, digits to get the most efficient um, uh, um, passing. But another huge change had gone. We had to move away from what we had, which was a hierarchical system of branch identification numbers to an interbank agreed standard of sort code numbers, which is still in use today. Now, what used to happen was that branches with uh, a, a number of uh, a branch number of three digits were the ones in the city, where it was possible for the messengers to walk between the branches and exchange vouchers physically. The ones with four digits were those that were in easy transport um, distance to the city, and the five-digit ones were the ones on the outside. My, uh, the branch, last branch I worked at, uh, the branch on the edges of North London, was uh, in Crouch Inn in Hornsey, 21946 was its number. It also had another number, that was 9 over 14. And what that meant was that it was sorting cage 9, pocket 14, when they were sorting manually. And all that had to change so that we had a, a sort code um, uh, system. So there's an awful lot going on in systems terms besides just the, the technology to keep these uh, uh, machines uh, happy. So the sorted batch details of Barclays checks were written to tape um, uh, or disk. 
The Barclays checks were physically sent to the Barclays branches. The other bank's checks went to the relevant computing centre. And eventually, as Ian mentioned, subsequently the 1401s were for clearing replaced by um, 360s, 3, 3, 370s. How did we do it on the EMIDEC? Well, that was interesting. IDM for clearing, EMIDEC at number one centre, incompatibility. <laughs> well, obvious incompatibility. Total incompatibility. Initially, what had to happen was that the EMIDEC branches were still entering the clearing details on their NCR systems, but while they were doing that, the ICL, um, ICT, became ICL, designed some hardware, which when they delivered, looked rather like an Electrolux refrigerator. Um, I think it actually was an Electrolux refrigerator because they found a model into which you could put a 19-inch electronics rack, and um, I think the refrigeration plant was enough to cool it. We set to work coding programs to read the direct input. And we read it, we read these, we attached these uh, fantastically uh, efficient IBM tape drives as paper tape readers. I'm not sure IBM were happy that we treated their rather sophisticated tape drives as a simple paper tape reader, but it worked beautifully. And when you think of how a paper tape reader works and how a sequential tape works, it's fairly, fairly logical. In any case, it worked, and uh, it was another first for Barclays. We had the two IBM 7330s linked to the second EMIDEC, and programmers there were paper tape readers, and it enabled all sorts of other direct inputs, such as the automated standing orders and salaries to be processed. We did have a problem. Uh, it was a big problem, uh, because what we'd done at number one was we numbered our branches quite arbitrarily. Branch one was Cavendish Square, branch two was um, uh, New Bond Street, branch three was the other one, Ian, just uh, Marble Arch, branch four was, I can't I can remember uh, many of them. And now we had sorting code numbers. And we were getting this stuff delivered to us in sorting code number order. Um, I actually wrote some uh, clever stuff which used the drum um, as uh, um, um, to, um, to um, record um, where each branch's uh, transactions as it came off of the IBM readers started and finished. And then I could access the drum remotely and I could output that then in our logical number order to help us get it into some sort of processing order. Um, if we had too many transactions, we couldn't do that, so we then just had to write it out to tape and um, the way that the branches worked, it was 17 two tape passes to get it into order. Well, I worked out a, a, a different algorithm, which I managed to get it down to seven in the end. But that's the sort of thing that we were doing. We had to be really innovative and uh, tr try to be really clever in those days. Lombard Street. Originally a 1460, um, which was an enhanced 1401, uh, the announcement, the famous announcement, the 7th of April, 1964, System 360, we went for that, Lombard Street had 64K, huge memory, 64K, wow, take on the world with that, operational by April 1966, but I think Ian mentioned, no remote transmission, because all the branches were literally just a few minutes away from 54 Lombard Street, where the machine was tucked, I think, in a corner on the first floor. Um, data is still input using paper tape, reports and statements printed on the online printers. Accounts held on disk, that was a, a big, um, big difference. These key differences, no links, close enough to move everything physically. And they had a very strict timetable to work to because the messengers would be there at a certain time. They expected their output. No delays, no nothing. The accounts um, uh, processed were different. We did not process deposit accounts on the MEDEX system. I've never been able to understand why, but we didn't. Um, at, but they did on the, um, on the uh, at Lombard. And they were remain, maintained on removable disks. And that was important. We'd only had tapes uh, on the Emidex system. They now had disks which would allow for both random access and sequential processing. And that was a big step forward, enabled them to do some clever applications. Things. And they were working under a, 
I know it's a primitive basic operating system, but they had an operating system to um, help them. Subsequently, we used the Lombard Street system to connect a couple of branches in Leicester using a telecommunications link. Our first steps into computer control, what became known as teleprocessing. And that enabled us to remotely control the paper tape readers at the branch. And the experience that we gained doing that was absolutely um, in invaluable for subsequent reasons. Ian's already explained the need for the Greater London um, Computer Centre. I won't bore you with that. It was the biggest machine that the bank had ever purchased at the time, with the, the 360 and 50, 256k bytes of memory, disc tapes, printers and things. There's an apocryphal story that the first time that an operating system was generated on this machine, um, one of my colleagues, a guy called Peter Harris, who subsequently went and worked for IBM, spent a whole Sunday generating this, and at the end of the the, the process, he, he um, pressed the button on the console and he typed in, God bless this system's generation. Hit enter and the system came back and said, God is not recognised. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't recognise the reserve word. It's an apocryphal story. Peter assures me that it's true. He says he's even got the printer up framed and hanging on the wall of his study, but I've never never seen it. There's lots, lots of apocryphal stories go, go around, as, as um, some of you will know. The Greater London application, like Lombard Street, was initially paper tape. Printed output um, carried to and from the centre. But we moved into using a new IBM device called the 3940. And that had integrated keyboards, printers and paper tape readers. And we connected these, again using leased lines. And as we would proven technically feasible at Lombard Street, we started to eliminate the need to re-perforate paper tape at the computer centre. And in due course, with the introduction of the TC500s all over the place, paper tape was eliminated altogether. The removable disk drives allowed transactions to be collected on, um, on disk and, and processed from disk, but we were still doing batch processing. But we did, at Greater London, to have to start to extend the supplier's software capability and we started to develop what became known as middleware to help us actually control and manage the update process. See, it was actually possible, sorry about guys who used to work for IBM, but in the early days you could actually remove a removable disk while processing was going on and put another one in its place and the operating system didn't re realise you'd done it. But there were other reasons. Things like the need, when we started to grow the number of branches, to make sure that if you were physically moving paper from the computer centre to the branches, that you process the distant branches first to give them a better chance of, 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 of being, um, of, uh, being uh, 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 delivered. And so this middleware was controlling things like scheduling and the processing to make sure everything was done was, um, was done in order. But it wasn't just the branch um, accounting stuff that was going on. Barclay card was going on, standing orders, salaries was being developed. We were developing the forerunner of the automatic teller machines, which we now have the, uh, um, um, uh, in the uh, hole in the walls. And all these systems also had implications for the branch accounting and the clearing systems. They all had to be constantly modified and updated to take all this stuff. And to its credit, the dear old MEDEX continued to work like a workhorse taking all this stuff. But what was happening technically was really important because all those developments were giving us an enormous amount of experience at integrating different technical architectures. And of course today, we don't think anything of integrating different technical architectures, but in those days it was different. Right, let's come on to the final wave. Now something completely different. Because something completely different was required, as Ian's explained, decimalisation. It was an emerge, it was a challenging deadline, the deadline was fixed, and Burroughs came in with its solution for real-time branch accounting, their multi-processor the 8500 mainframes having the revolutionary TC500 intelligent hybrid device. But as Ian explained, it wasn't just, it wasn't just um, Barclays, Midlands, and then the then National Provincial also investigated. What did we use at Barclays? What did we try to use? Well, 
There were two Model 8500s, the one and the two. Neither of them were delivered. I have something, though. and 6500s which were upgraded to 67s and we had actually three of each of those in the end. We had three processor sets and lots of terminal devices from, from Burroughs. The 3500s, 5100s, the 80s, 90s, the modular terminal system. Elsewhere in subsidiary and offshore companies we were using mini systems. So it wasn't all bad news for the, for the Burroughs salesmen. They had an, an enormous amount in, their, in our branches and, and, and uh, small offices. And they did, right through to the early, early 1980s, they effectively were the sole supplier of terminal devices in, uh, in, in the um, branches. What did these things look like? Well, there's some typical 57, 5500 configurations. I can't tell you which ones they were because when I found these pictures on the web, it didn't say. 6700s look like this, but these are real ones. These are not cardboard cutouts like the 80, 80, um, 85 um, hundreds, and you can find these things if, if you want to. The systems for us, technically, were incredibly different. Ian mentioned a technical team that was set up. Stan Gray, Gene Heap, Malcolm Sanders, and me. Um, me, I was the machine code expert. I could write in binary if I had to. Stan was brilliant on um, assembler. What uh, he didn't know about assembler wasn't worth writing down. So Malcolm had an enormous amount of experience on uh, machine code and assembler type languages. Jean, she was great on high level languages. These Burroughs machines were programmed only in high level languages, including the operating system. They were all multiprocessor systems where every processor in the system was capable of multitasking. On the 6700 machine, there were three processor types. Those for uh, executing standard um, in, in instructions, the specialist I.O. processors, and linked to the specialist I.O. processors, the programmable data communications processors. You had multiple threads all capable of operating. There was none of this read a line, write a card type operation. It was all happening at the same time. No wonder it was deemed suitable for uh, real time. And all this stuff was supposed to go in the 8500s as, as well. There were stack machines used reverse Polish no, no, notation logic. The programs operated in the mid-1960s in virtual memory, real virtual memory. Automatic memory assignment, automatic program segmentation, automatic subroutine links. A process, uh, you could have a program which where one bit of it was operating on one processor and the next microsecond is operating on another um, processor. Absolutely amazing. You couldn't modify the code and that was a great feature because it meant you could have re-entrant and recursive code. However, when I was developing the online system for the 6700, I did find a limit. They wouldn't let me recurse more than 256 times and that was a bit of a pain for one particular applicant. User programs, COBOL, ARBOL, or FORTRAN. The MCP was written in a language called ESPOL, Executive Scheduling Programming Language. ESPOL and all the compilers were written in ALGOL. Um, I learned most of my ALGOL by actually printing out a listing of the ALGOL compiler. The state communication systems were written in a language called DC ALGOL. We had to define networks using a language called Network Definition Language, which fed something called the DCP Program Generator. And this was brilliant because you generated a program for your communications front end specific to your devices and your network configuration. Absolutely amazing. I was privileged to actually work um, on, uh, on some of that um, uh, software with uh, a guy called Dave Mominy, um, 
who work for boroughs because uh, what um, um, Ian didn't tell you was that we had specified a whole load of um, changes that we felt were necessary to operate a real-time system and the boroughs turned around and said, if you want someone to get the operating systems and the compilers changed in that way, you better give us someone to um, work on it with us. And yours truly was nominated. And I spent a lot of the period between the beginning of 1968 and uh, the uh, middle of 1971 commuting to the United States, uh, commuting either to Pasadena, um, um, with, with a software development facility or to, um, or to Detroit. Um, it was really interesting, of course, for me to, um, to do that. But the real thing that um, uh, was uh, of interest, of course, to all the banks, was this, the TC500. That is the first TC500 that was delivered to Barclays Bank. It was um, uh, located by my colleague Jerry Jarvis, who also helped Ian with um, some input for his, his doctorate and it was refurbished for the bank by, um, by Burroughs and that is on display at the um, bank's archives um, which also happened to be near Withenshaw, just uh, north of the airport, just seven south of Manchester. Um, I did offer to go and get that operational for them. Uh, it was turned down point blank. Health and safety. <laughs> they wouldn't let me power it on. Um, I could have, um, I could have ha had that actually running um, for them, but they wouldn't let me to power it on for health and safety um, reasons. So it's not just down here, Chris. Uh, <laughs> we have health and safety problems. The TC500. Ian's mentioned some of this. It was both a physical record and a um, device and an online system. It had an interesting disk memory. The whole memory was on a ceramic disk. It had 40 tracks. Each had 32 words of 8 bytes each. There were 30 tracks were used for microcode or firmware as they called it. There were two tracks required for data communications. And there were eight tracks there which you could use for user programming. It was fully programmable. We used an assembler type um, uh, uh, language which was called SL3 updated to SL5 for subsequent models, single address instruction system with accumulators. It did actually have three processors, one with the main CPU and two separate microprocessors for communication so that you could actually transmit and receive at the same time. Capable there for a full duplex async transmission. We loaded um, programs using paper tape readers at the high speed of 10 characters a second. Um, some people, some users managed to actually get an external paper tape reader which would load at 20 characters a second. And the split printer allowed separate um, uh, uh, operating patterns. And that was really quite important for the, um, what became the real-time, on-time um, ap application. Because this is what we actually did. We made this work on the 5500, but we couldn't scale it. This was the real-time accounting system simplified. You remember that Ian said that there was a, a, a priority of transactions. Not all financial transactions had top priority. Some file amendments had actually top priority. Inquiries had a different priority. These were collected by a data common communication system which we developed, which we made work because the, um, we could just not get what were called the IO intrinsics for communicating with the TC500 to work. I got so fed up with it that one weekend I just took the listing and the specification of the protocol sequences home with a guy who worked with me called Peter Atkins. We spent all weekend at my house in Barnet working on it. We rewrote that chunk of the operating system. On the Monday morning I got there at 6 o'clock, said to the duty engineer, I want to run the system on my version of the operating system. I know you can't support me, Pete. He said, don't be so daft, let's run it. And we recompiled the operating system and a TC500 chatter when we started. And that's what Ian said about making it work. And that's what we were doing. So we actually did all the data comms, because the guy who was supposed to do it in Burroughs, for whatever reason, decided to leave. 
We, had a, we wrote our own user executive for scheduling real-time updates and inquiries and for doing everything necessary to enable us to restart um, and, and recover. My good friend Stan Bray, who was hoping to be here today, but if you talk to Stan and say, how are you, Stan? He'll say, I'm fine from the waist up. He's, um, poor old Stan's legs are going. So, but we're going to repeat this in Manchester, and if necessary, I'll take Stan door to door. <coughs> Stan designed a complete database system, because there wasn't one, with all the I.O., so that all the COBOL programmers who were programming these updates and inquiries, all they had to do was to say read or write or whatever and everything was taken care of. We had to handle the direct input, of course, and that was handled um, separately. The interesting thing was that everything, that all the replies, went by a response file, a reports and response file. And you will see that the only part of the system that had separate access was the data communications. That was because Peter and I found a way of continuing to operate data communications if this lot fell over. And that was important because the last thing you wanted in a real time where you've got no batching at all is to say to the branches, we've got a, a computer center failure, you're going to have to stay till 8 o'clock tonight and put the entries in. So at least we could bring the stuff in um, and, uh, and queue it. In a nutshell, that was the, um, the real time system. Obviously it was more complex um, than, than that. And um, Roger, if you want me to sometime, I'll, I'll give you a whole series on it. Um, uh, I've still got all the specifications, all the flowcharts, and a lot of the listings. So the real-time system did operate on the 5500. And following the decision to, to cancel real-time, the Greater London application was migrated to the B6700. And this was really interesting because we took the applications programs written in COBOL and the only issues we had recompiling the IBM COBOL source on cards on the Burroughs machines was I.O. And you would expect that with the completely different architectures. Not sure what would have happened if the boot had been on the other foot. I really don't know whether the IBM COBOL compiler could have coped in the same way with, I expect it, it probably could, with a high degree of um, accuracy. And that's because um, the I.O. was different as was the data. <coughs> and, but this, this online stuff was still needed. We still needed to collect it, all the information from the branches, but instead of feeding updates and inquiries, we just fed a data collection system. And again, we still needed a different middleware system, and that was developed to manage the overnight batch processing um, uh, uh, operation. It was a source of incredibly valuable experience, and I'll just share with you quickly two examples. You can imagine that a system that was being designed to do everything for the bank needed some very complex setups, specifying the, the structure of the branches, the equipment in the branches, and all sorts of things, and the what we call today the load tables required for the applications, for the comm systems, for the middleware, the executive systems, for the NDL and the DCP generators. If you didn't get that consistent and correct, you're going to have a problem. So we decided, we took a decision to develop a single application which automatically generated all the details and the code for this required for that lot. And the logic, my logic was very simple. If I was going to have an error in this, I would rather everyone worked on the same wrong set of data. Instead of the situation which you have, if you've got two copies, and you all know this, guys, you can have both of them right, both of them wrong, one right, the other wrong, and vice versa, and it's exponential. So if we were working on some, something wrong, everybody was working on it wrongly, and you could put it um, right uh, through a single application. Subsequently, on the big integrated IBM systems with all the intelligent stuff that went on in the branches, they needed to develop something that ran on the IBM machine, and this was developed into something called the ANC, the Automatic Network Configurator. And we used to wind up trainees by telling them that this system produced so much output that we had a whole fleet of white lorries which went up and down the motorway with ANC on the side. And some of them actually believed it. The other thing that 
was, was brilliant, was this multi-processing, multi-tasking capability. Allowed us, particularly for data comms um, um, uh, problems, because if you've got a hiccup on the line, the last thing you want to do is adopt the old-fashioned COBOL approach, which is write a line on the console and stop the run. You want to try and work it out. And so guys like Jim France, uh, Jeff Johnson, um, um, Glenn Leonard, who were, who were telecoms experts who were working there, we said to them, if you get these type of errors, what should we do? How should we diagnose it? And we used their expertise to apply some early expert systems techniques to processing online errors. And we had a very simple system. A device in a branch was either being processed normally or it's being processed because there was something wrong with it. And the nice thing was, you could separate it out and without interfering with the, um, with the um, um, operation of the, uh, the normal devices. Peter Atkins, who worked with me, he did some, um, he, he produced some monitoring uh, statistics and it showed on the data comms processors, when the branches were working flat out, the system idle light was glowing on the data comms processors. That's how efficient the online system was. It just sat there as though the machine was doing nothing all day long. So that wasn't the issue with these machines. The issue was all the integration of the, uh, the, the complexities of the ap applications. And so these and many other experiences we carried forward into subsequent systems. This stuff was eventually used. Um, the look on, his fa on, on, on uh, the, the general manager's face, Roger, when I said to him, can I buy an IBM mainframe, please, sir? He said, what for? I said, to do network management. And he said, what's your justification? I said, I can reduce 43 screens on the bridge to one. And that means I cut the number of people monitoring it from 43 to one. Because we applied expert systems. And as far as I know, they still, they, they still do it. But I haven't been there for, for quite a few years. So, some anecdotes. And they are finished here. In the early days, no compilers, assemblers, or operating systems. We were often writing in machine code. Mostly with absolute addressing, we had to be accurate. But then we had to work in high-level software when machine code working would have been really useful. Stan and I found, found a way of actually being able to work in machine code on the Burroughs machines. I found that out by actually looking, studying the Algol compiler and found constructs that you will never see in an Algol reference manual. And we worked out how to use them, including how we could take control away from the operating system and change all the priorities to do what we wanted to do. So we often had to extend the suppliers' capabilities. And as Ian Batchy mentioned, already what, most of what we did was data processing rather than computing. And the problems were the sheer volumes. The actual logic, of the computational logic, adding and subtracting and doing a few multiplies and divides was very straightforward. It was the sheer volume of data. But it really was a real source of incredibly valuable experience to work on those early systems. Particularly when you actually think back and realise that most of us were bank clerks who 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 were being trained, and so we got to 19, 1974. And I'm going to I haven't got a slide on this, but in 1974, and I used to love this. I occasionally was privileged to give presentations uh, at IBM events, and I used to ask my audience what three things happened in 1974, really important things, because lots of other things were going on in Barclays at the same time. And the answers are, you might remember this one, Roger, in 1974, IBM announced, announced SNA version 1. It didn't deliver anything for a little while, but they announced it. <coughs> a little upstart in a little town called Cupertino, south of San Francisco, in his garage, started to build, a guy called uh, Trabi, started to build tandem machines, which were designed to operate non-stop in a full-tolerant mode. And Barclays implemented its BINS network, which operated fault-tolerant, virtually non-stop, continuous processing for 19 years. When in 1993, at Withenshaw Computer Center, Jeff Horn and I had our photograph taken, throwing the power off on the last of the processors. So there was a lot going on. Gonna finish with just a word of caution. A final suggestion. If you're going to look at the internet about the early history of Barclays, please don't believe everything you see. There are some 
really bad errors relating to both MEDEC and Boris systems. And unfortunately, I've seen that some of these are now actually being published in books produced electronically. So the errors and the, the factual inconsistencies are being um, uh, uh, perpetuated. But I can tell you this, because I've followed Ian's doctorate from when, where was it Ian? I got it somewhere. Uh, can't, can't find it there. Must be, might, might be down here. No, he, he, he did produce this uh, little advert in our pensioners magazine. And um, some of us got in touch with him. And um, I think um, some might say the rest is history. His doctoral thesis and academic papers, they're incredibly well researched. And they're well worth looking at, particularly the latest one on ahead of its time in the Burris, Burris system. So we've taken a little longer than we should have done, but thank you for letting us talk to you today. We hope you found some of that interesting. And Roger, if you want us to come back and talk in any more detail, I'm sure that Ian and I would be happy to do that. <laughs>
never, never quite gets there. Instead, well, there's a lot of various wangles invented, yeah. like nap routers, to uh, yeah. avoid the need. Well, um, the colleagues may like to know that an eight-digit account number is not an eight-digit account number, it's a six-digit account number, where um, the um, least significant digit is a modulus 11 check on the preceding six digits, and the um, the eighth most significant digit is a modulus 10 check on the whole thing, including the five, six digits of the sort code numbers which the account number is allocated. Did you get that? Yes. <laughs> in, in other words, you've got a million. You've got a million combinations, um, theoretically, but you don't because they don't all pass the modulus 11 um, uh, um, uh, check. Um, it, they haven't run out yet. But they did have a, a, a situation where you couldn't reuse account numbers for a, a period, but I think that's, that, 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 that period has had to be um, reduced. They no longer allocate account numbers, um, they don't, the bank staff, they certainly in Barclays don't allocate the account numbers anymore, the computers allocate the account numbers. There's a much more interesting problem around that, though, that personalization. Well, the internet, of course, they've gone back to names with the DNS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. how do you go back to names and how do you actually um, tell someone that I, I know your name is John Smith, but we already have an account John Smith, so you all have to be John Smith 2364 or something. You know? um, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue, isn't it? An another issue around that is that, of course, for all, most of the financial stuff that we deal with, um, you have an insurance policy, you phone up about it, what's the number? Phone up about your bank account, what's the number? Phone up about your credit card, what's the number? And um, how do you identify a customer with multiple relationships with all those numbers? And that was an interesting problem. That's another lecture. Um, I got an award for that from Barclays in 1986 because I came up with the relational data model to solve the problem that they're, they're using today. But that, again, that's a real problem, you know, getting away from the names. The banks now let you recycle uh, account numbers. For example, I've just changed. Uh, normally, I set into a, a two-year external. Maybe you don't change the account Are you sure it's an account number and not a customer number? Uh, well, it's it's all code in the account number. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 sorry. Clarify that point. Is it a million customers? Are you allowed a million accounts per sort code, per barcode, <laughs> or per world? And then can I tell no, you? Um, uh, there, there are theoretically a million combinations per sort code. Per sort code. But because of the modulus 11, you don't have a million, um, so you have less than that. So it's quite a big number, in, in, in fact. How many salt codes? There's only six digits in a salt code. Yeah, yeah, so there's only um, theoretically a million of those as well. Can I ask my own question? Yes, of course. What, what, what was the real problem of it getting determined to talk to the central processor? Was it sort of electrical, or, or, or the speed of the lines, or, or multiprocessing, or what was the real number of the problem? Well, I suppose Commander Grace Hopper would say it was a dirty great bug. Um, the logic just, we just did not understand the logic. So Peter and I, who had been studying um, the way the operating systems worked in any case, um, and we have a degree of familiarity with SVOL, we just took the engineering specifications for the protocol, yeah. looked at how it was implemented, got some understanding of it, and then wrote our own routine. So that we didn't even attempt to work out what wasn't working because we just could not see how the logic was flowing. So we rewrote it and ours worked and Burroughs finally took it and I, I said to him, look, this works, we're going to test on this, can you take it, sanitise it within the operating system? And subsequently I found out that someone had put a little comment in there that we're grateful to David and Peter for getting some of this working type thing. And that's the sort of thing that they did in those days. I think it's an important point to make about the boroughs and, the, and the, you know, this newness of boroughs was something that Barclays had to get on top of yeah. and, and boroughs themselves had to get on top of because this was a banking, real-time banking application. I mean, of all the banks for the May D-Day, nobody made it apart from Lloyds. Only Lloyds made D-Day and, yeah. and automated all its branches and Lloyds was the only bank to stick with one supplier from yeah. the start to the finish and it was IBM. So there's a, there's it was a, still basic batch processing, wasn't yeah. it? But they did it. it, it, well, yeah. it, it yeah. They had that continuity, if you like, that, that learning experience with one supplier. Whereas obviously you had every deck with IBM, you were, you were learning boroughs, but there's always yeah. different technologies to learn. Yeah. 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 
one of the things I should have told you about the end of it, of course, and some of you will know this, is that it actually had the ability to process in pounds, shillings, and pence. I had instructions for actually manipulating stone. I think that my father said to me, when we went there, he said that there's a lot of cutting in on it. He worked in an insurance practice. They have to change all their machinery. And he said, no, you don't. Just ignore the, pound, the shillings and pence and use the pounds yeah. and write a decimal point in two columns. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, you, your range yeah. isn't so good, but you can carry on using the lot of Ab machinery. Ab absolutely. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, 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 the whole concept of the decimal currency is pretty simple, really. I mean, just cut, and that's what happens now in uh, in, in the banks. They, they don't calculate in, in pounds, they calculate in pence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fixed yeah. Yes, fixed point. Yeah. Well, well, I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Ian and David, thank you very much indeed right, yeah. for a very interesting, very informative and detailed talk and best wishes in your new career. Thank you. Please thank you for